This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hi, everybody. Cheryl from Unleashed. And today I have a very special show for all of our listeners. We have Dr. Carol Osborne on, and her accolades could go on for a page. But she's the real deal. She's well known. She writes books. She has her own clinic, and she's an expert on anti aging for dogs. And we all need that because uh, unfortunately, today our dogs are not living to the ripe old age like they did when I was a child. So welcome, Carol. Oh, thank you so much. So we're here for really serious business because this mysterious dog virus, which started in Colorado, seems to be working its way east, was in 14 states. And then last night I read that it's now in 37 states. So what's the skinny on it? What do you know about it? Well, I... What I know is that it starts with coughing. So if you got a dog who's been coughing for six, maybe eight or more weeks, that is the first most common sign that a pet owner might see. And most people would have been to the vet. So it's a cough, a deep, hacking cough, kind of like kennel cough, but it does not respond to antibiotics. With kennel cough, same kind of cough. It does respond to antibiotics, and normally it self-limits in two to three weeks. So you got three phases. One is the long cough without minimal to no antibiotic response. The second way that it can present is with a chronic or a long-term pneumonia that, once again, has minimal to no response to an antibiotic. The third way that it presents is with acute or a sudden onset of pneumonia that can become fatal in one to two days, which is very, very serious. What else can I tell you? I can tell you that it is an airborne, they believe they're leaning to a viral cause. So think of COVID, think of the flu. To me, it's COVID for dogs. That's exactly what it sounds like. You know, and that is exactly how pet owners should think of it in many respects. So what are you going to do? You're going to isolate. You're going to avoid dog park, grooming salon, boarding kennels. Isolate, number one. Number two, good sanitation. Wash your hands. Clean food and water bowls and toys. Really practice good, good, good sanitation. Hey, if your dog is coughing, take off the collar. You don't want to further traumatize an area that is already traumatized. These are just really basic things. And then build up your dog's immunity. So how do you do that? Well, really good, fresh, organic, if possible, homemade nutrition, homemade food. And there are two supplements, herbal and regular, uh, many of which are over the counter, that you can offer your pup to build up his immunity to fight these airborne viruses, such as, you know, the one in this case, Cheryl. You know, I also heard, that for a lot of people, they don't really know. I mean, when Tilly did have kennel cough last year and she sounded like a duck, but they say some of the coughing sounds like they're trying to clear their throat. So, you know, you might not be aware of that your dog has it, but how do you think it started? Somebody said maybe non-vaccinated dogs, which everywhere I go, Um, Even to get her nails done, they want complete medical records, I mean, which is good. Very good. For people going to the veterinarian, just what you said just now, what can a pet owner do to try to, you know, protect their pet? If you go to the vet, first of all, call ahead and try to arrange an appointment so that you are not sitting in a waiting room with a bunch of other dogs. Uh, Early morning, late in the afternoon, some veterinary clinics may even come out to the car to vaccinate your dog. The two vaccines that veterinary experts recommend to protect your pooch is the kennel cough, which is a bordetella, and the second one is influenza dog. So is it a guarantee? No. But is it what the experts are recommending? Certainly it is. So if you can do those two things, that's really good. 
the fact of the matter, what you asked me before, you know, where did it come from and this and that, I've done a lot of research on this topic. And as far as I can tell, this has been around for just about a year out west in, you know, Oregon, kind of out in that area. But it didn't start becoming a really big issue until much more recently when um, some of these dogs, you know, started to basically drop dead. It's very scary. Like Tilly is due for her influenza in January, but I could get it sooner than that, correct? If it was me, that's exactly what I would do. I had people come into my office today who got it six months early. So it, a lot of these, even like the Bordetella, which is the kennel cough, they're really effective for six months. And after that, the immunity wanes. So don't, don't be afraid to booster your dog a little bit early because it can only help you. Yeah, she just got that. But I get that twice a year because we go to the park. Now, we're not going to the park because, you know, they all drink out of the same bowl and they all steal each other's balls. But in my park, there is three separate areas, one for the big dogs, one for the medium and a very narrow pen that a policewoman uses for her dog. And I've been very lucky and I will only go if there's nobody around just to throw the ball. But other than that, you know, I'm going to have a problem because my dog is young and she really needs to run. And, you know, like you were saying when we had the last talk about the breast cancer and the first or the second heat, really at two years old, how much immunity does a young dog really have? Well, quite honestly, you have gone through the puppy stage, which is where, you know, the most vulnerable, uh, just like you and me, Cheryl, the very young and the very old and dogs suffering with a chronic condition, you know, lung lung problems, kidney, liver failure, cancer, things like that. Those are the ones that you really have to watch out for. But a two-year-old, properly vaccinated, well-cared-for dog has everything going in the right direction. And what I would say is, yeah, sure, your dog has to get outside and run and exercise and all that. But what you don't want to do is let your dog drink out of some bowl where 55,000 other dogs ever right. drink. Right, definitely. And I really have to say, because I'm not going to be boarding her and, you know, I'm blessed with a friend who could come and stay with her if I need to go away. But I'm very disappointed in some of the boarders. You know, they send me an email. We, You know, the holidays are coming up. They should have put in place already that your dog will be kept alone it will get exercise alone because there are people with the holidays coming up. You know, people are going to travel and people, are, you know, I'm in Florida. Those snowbirds are going to come with their dogs. And that's just how COVID started down here. And I've had multiple people come in all week long. And the fact is they've made their plans. They've got their reservations. They've got deposits on their hotels, airfare, et cetera. They're not changing their plans. I'd rather be safe than heartbroken. Yeah. When it comes to many of the kennels, if you want me to be completely honest with you, even the best kennel, you are putting your pet at risk. That's just the truth. To expect people that work in a kennel to really have sanitation the way that it needs to be to prevent, you know, the spread of this type of an airborne, presumably viral issue, it's a lot to ask. Even as a person, are you going to walk around with a mask on every day? It's quite a lot. And you also have to remember with viruses like this, Cheryl, fomites. You know, what is a fomite? Well, your shoes, your hat, your coat, your pants. Right. Um, how can my pet get sick, Dr. Cheryl? I hear this all the time. My pet stays inside. It never goes outside. And I say, but you do. You bring the outside in. And when it's a disease like the one we're talking about here, fomites, or again, your shoes, your clothes, your gloves, all those things, they carry the stuff from the outside in. So it's a lot. Remember back with COVID, there were people, when Amazon had a package, you left it outside for a day and then you sanitized it before you brought it in the house. Right, um, right. I had friends that did that with groceries. They sanitized every item before they put it in the refrigerator. A friend of mine worked in a hospital and whenever he came home, he would change in his garage, take off his shoes. There you go. All right. I mean, I walk and the dogs in my area, they're not really, you know, dog park dogs. They don't really go I mean, once in a blue moon and that's fine. But 
You know, I, I'm not taking any chances, but we don't know how long this will last. And from what I've been reading, they're having problems really monitoring this, like you know, keeping track of it. The problem is, you know, like my customer said to me, is it in Ohio yet? Is it in Ohio yet? And I said, well, it probably is in Ohio since it is in all the surrounding states, but they don't know that unless it's been reported. So that's the number one thing is, has it been officially reported? And veterinarians may be seeing these coughing dogs. They may or may not realize that, you know, it could be this mystery dog respiratory situation and a vet might pick up the phone and report it and, and another vet might not. It's hard to say. But maybe that's why we went from 12 to 14 to 37 states basically overnight. Yeah. And what really gets me is we don't really know how it started, but they're also saying in some of the reports that I've been reading that when people stayed in for COVID along with their pets, everybody became sterile specimens that nobody ever went out. I mean, I, my father's 98. And I visit somebody in a nursing home who's 103. When I go to the supermarket or on a crowd, I wear a mask. I don't really care. I haven't had it, knock wood, and I've got all my shots. But what you're saying about the shoes and the dogs do bring in the outside, even for themselves. Sure, that's exactly right. And the other thing to remember, Carol, is that a vaccine what does it really do? It raises your level of immunity. So it raises the chances that if you come in direct contact with whatever the agent is, the chances that you're going to recover from it are a lot higher. So there is no vaccine that gives a 100% guarantee. Right. Well, we know that with COVID. Exactly. Or the flu. The flu is a, is a prime example. Is there a very high chance that this could possibly be some type of a variance, if you will, of a flu type virus. I don't think that that's out of the question. No, no. And, you know, I've read reports that fewer people are vaccinating their dogs today. You know, probably the same mentality as people aren't up to date, you know, with COVID or never really wanted to get COVID sure. you know, vaccines. And there are some dogs that, you know, out in the boondock somewhere in West Virginia or whatever state that are hunting dogs, they don't come in contact with anybody. So maybe the owners are laxed on that. I mean, I got Tilly the three-year rabies. I'm talking about the rabies. You're 100% correct. You go to different areas of the country and things change. People, people get different messages, different types of communication. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's still people who don't want to new to their animals because they want to breed them. That's exactly, that is exactly right. I call people out. We don't need any more dogs. If 1% of the people who talk about getting a dog got a dog, the shelters would have to put up a sign, we're empty. It's bad. That's exactly right. And part of the reason that this disease started, you know, hitting the newspapers and the media, if you will, is because at some of these shelters, dogs started dropping dead and the shelter started getting overwhelmed. You know, they closed down, they couldn't take any more dogs, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was one shelter and another shelter and another shelter. And that is what brought a lot of the situation to light, if you will. You know, that's where it started to hit hard. They are taking these PCR tests that can rule out six or seven of these upper respiratory bacteria and viral illnesses in dogs, trying to hit on what the dog may or may not have, as well as potentially figure out how to identify whatever this new agent is. It's very, very scary because, you know, yes. our pets are our family. And like you say, the outside comes in even before this. You know, I think our last conversation, we talked about that, you know, about, you know, the animals are bringing, they're close to the ground. Tilly, she could be the president of That's exactly Park. right. That is exactly right. And it's something, you know, you roll around in the grass and the next minute you're in mom's bed. That's reality. We were talking about the PCR test. Yes. And that test, A, is being used to rule out or rule in six or seven different viral and bacteria causes uh, of upper, you know, respiratory infections in dogs to see if your dog may possibly have one. 
it's also being used to try to potentially figure out exactly what is causing this this illness. So if you have a sick dog, you know, as I said earlier, call ahead so that you're not walking into a room full of dogs. Right. But let the veterinarian do the PCR test and see what they can and cannot figure out for sure. And I wanted to mention, Cheryl, that there are some natural homeopathic and otherwise remedies that we could share with your dog listeners that can be very, very helpful if you have a coughing dog or if you just want to boost up your dog's immunity a little bit. Okay. I got my pen out. (laughs) Okay. So let's just talk about some homeopathic remedies. Remember that homeopathic remedies are over the counter. Uh, They're little pellets. You never want to touch them with your fingers because if you do, you just inactivate them. But the general rule of thumb for all of them is basically three to five pellets need to go in your dog's mouth, even if it's just inside, you know, the lip. No food or water for 10 minutes before or after. The strength, uh, just go for 30 uh, C as in Charlie. And you can repeat the remedies two to three times a day. If you've given a remedy for a day and you've not gotten the response, switch to a different remedy. They either work or they don't work. There's there's no in between. That being said, what are they uh, called? Well, I'm going I'm going to tell you that right now. There's many many different ones. So, first of all, aconite, A C O N I T E. This is helpful in the early stages of coughing when it seems like your dog might have something caught in his or her throat, which is something Cheryl you mentioned earlier. Number 2, Drosera, D R O S is in Sam, E-R-A, is helpful for the dry cough. The dog can have violent coughing spells, ticklish throats, if you will, and the cough may be worse when the dog is lying down. Okay. Number three, Rumex, R-U-M-E-X, second word, Crispus, C-R-I-S-P-U-S, uh, helpful with dry, persistent dog coughs. Okay. The last one I have is Spongia. S-P-O-N-G-I-A, TOSTA, T-O-S-T-A, a croupy type of a cough that improves with eating and drinking, but gets worse if your pet drinks something cold. Oh, okay. What is the difference between if it's bacteria or a virus? Oh, well, that's easy. If it's a virus, it doesn't respond to antibiotics. If it's bacterial, that's when antibiotics come in handy. So the way it works in general, is that you have a viral problem. Like, let's say you have the flu. The flu is a virus. Well, what happens if it goes unchecked? What does the virus do? The virus lowers your immunity. What that means is it opens the doors for those secondary bacteria to move right in. To your lungs. You got it. So the person gets the flu, but what do they die of? Bacterial pneumonia. That's it. A a 16-year-old healthy young girl whose father was a doctor, died within a day of getting the flu. There you go. Right. And she didn't die of the flu. She died of the bacterial pneumonia. Right. And that's what these dogs seem to be dying of in one or two days. That's exactly right. And that's why you want to booster up your pet's immunity. We've talked about good homemade nutrition many times. What else can people do? Well, vitamin C, ascorbic acid. Small dogs up to 35 pounds, uh, 250 milligrams. Medium dogs, 35 to 75 pounds, about 500 milligrams. Dogs 75 pounds and up, take it up to 750 milligrams. You can do that once or twice a day. Zinc, one to five milligrams a day. Again, small, medium, large, depending on the size of the dog. Vitamin E, you want to go anywhere from about 5 to 50 milligrams a day, again, depending on the size of your dog. What about yogurt? Yogurt is has good calcium, right? It can have good calcium. A lot of people go to the yogurt because of the probiotics or the living bacteria that are in some yogurts. My suggestion, because yogurt has got lots of sugar in it, is if you're looking for probiotics, which are those friendly bacteria that line the colon, whose job it is to absorb the previously digested nutrients in the diet so as to produce a nice, solid, normally formed stool, is just go out and get a good probiotic supplement, which we have excellent probiotic supplements on our website at the drcarol.com. 
other things you can do if you maybe have a little coffee and dog. How about a cup of warm chamomile tea? A teaspoon of locally grown honey? Honey is the magic. Honey is good forever. I always take a teaspoon of honey. It coats your throat. It's wonderful. Locally grown is the best. Again, depending on the size of your dog, you can go from a, a, a teaspoon to a couple teaspoons every few hours. It's a natural cough suppressant. They lick it right off the spoon and they love it. And for those of you that are into Manuka honey, that's antibacterial, antiviral, and antimicrobial. You know, you can go with a, a teaspoon every, you know, 30 to 35 pounds every three or four hours. What about just if the dog is healthy? Isn't honey still good? To give a dog? Honey is good. Don't give too much honey because, you know, it's got a lot of sugar in it, if, if you will. But other things you can do, your omega-3 fatty acids, which are available in liquid and, uh, you know, those gel caps. Uh -huh. Those are terrific for just about everything you can possibly think of. And the way that you prepare your pet's meals, whether you prepare raw or cook, boil them, fry it, bake it, grill it. You know, go for that lean protein, chicken, turkey, beef, veal, fresh fish, eggs, your long acting carbohydrates, potatoes, quinoa, pasta or oatmeal, and the fresh veggies, broccoli, spinach, green beans, limas, Brussels sprouts. Cook them any way you want. Mix them all together. That's Tilly's supper. There That's you go. I, that's what I make her. Yeah. The top three flavors most dogs like barbecue sauce, pasta or tomato sauce, and low sodium tamari, which it looks just like soy sauce, but they call it tamari. You get a bottle for a few bucks. It'll last you for six months and balance out the meal with a nice, comprehensive, USA-made balanced vitamin, mineral, antioxidant supplement. For example, like Paws or Paws Plus that is also available on our website and is excellent and balances out all those great homemade foods, homemade recipes. You mean I could give Tilly barbecue sauce or, you know, like for just just the liquid part, just to give it a little bit more taste? Absolutely. Oh, Remember, wow. you know, Cheryl, you and I, we walk in the room and we see the room. But when dogs walk in the room, they smell the room. Oh, she goes the dog crazy world is food. all about smell. Yep, and she goes crazy for her food, believe me. The best thing I ever did. Yeah, when you're making your dog's food, it's not really the taste, it's the smell that's getting them to that food bowl. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's a good thing. Wonderful. Oh, really? That's very helpful stuff. I want you to give our listeners your website and their phone number because I know that you don't have any problem if they have questions and Really, after this airs, they're going to have questions, especially because if it's in 37 states as we talk, we're going to wake up in a couple of days. And it's going to be in all 50. And it's, and it's in Canada also. Well, now you got multiple countries. So pet lovers can give us a call toll free at 1-855-DR-CAROL, which is 855-372-2765. You can visit us online at chagrinfallspetclinic.com. Chagrin is an Indian word referring to the river that runs through Ohio, and it's C-H-A-G-R-I-N, chagrinfallspetclinic.com. That's wonderful. And you're also an expert on the anti-aging because our pets aren't living the way they were when we were younger. Um, I had pets 15, 16, 17 years old. I think people today are lucky if they get their pets to 12 or 13 years. And, you know, it's, I think a lot of it is definitely the food and environmental. And you're right. And, um, you know, I was going to mention a couple other things. Coconut oil. Anybody into coconut oil? Yeah, I heard about that. That's wonderful. One to two teaspoons per 10 pounds of body weight, you know, divide it up in your dog's food. And if you got a dog who's all stuffed up, turn on the shower, sit in the hot shower, steam up the room, sit in there for five or 10 minutes a few times a day, or buy a humidifier, add a little eucalyptus, put it in a small room, you know, 15 to 30 minutes a couple times a day. And if, if his or her nose is all cut up with mucus, go to the drugstore, get one of those nasal aspirators, you know, like for a baby. Right. And get mucus out of the nose. And that's going to work a lot better. A little massage, some soft music, and lots of love. Yeah. I want to ask you, have you seen this kind of virus before? 
I have two dogs right now that may or may not have this mysterious illness. But I mean, in your career, have you seen something like this affect dogs? The flu, influenza, absolutely almost identical. You have to go back a few years, but, um, you know, it was the swine flu epidemic, as as I recall, a few years back. And where did it start? China. Then there's diseases, you know, in England, there was this horse that was grazing out under this gorgeous tree. And when they brought her into the paddock, horses started to die. And they found that there was a, a family of bats living in the tree and it would suck on the, the uh, fruit and then droppings. And the horse was grazing and got sick and got everybody in the paddock. I mean, like 20 horses died. So, you know, humans and animals, people really have to realize how close it is. First of all, we live together. Yep. How close it is with these illnesses. Yes. So that's why, like, whatever happened in China, you know, with the wet market or whatever, and in the Amazon, with all of these animals and humans, it's too close. We really have to find a way that we could you know, do better for our animals and ourselves, because this is scary. So what you're really saying, like with the swine flu, (laughs) that was pigs. And what did we have? All of the chickens they had to kill last year, thousands, millions of chickens. They still are. They still are. Because it went from the pigs to the birds, to the people. And then, of course, to the dogs. And that's how, you know, really diseases start. So we're looking at a really good year close to a year for this to wind your way out. And then now they're going to be stuck in the house again. Right. Quarantined again. Yes. And then when they go out, they're like little virgins. Any kind of germ is going to affect them. That's exactly right. Correct. So we all have to sanitize, isolate, and find a way to live our lives. Good nutrition and boost up your immunity are, are two steps in the right direction. Right. Right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. You're always such a wealth of knowledge and enlighten us. I want to thank Mark. I want to thank Tilly for making me a dog owner again. (laughs) Thank my listeners. And remember to live life unleashed. See you next time. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.